Thank you. May be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, looking once again at verses 15 through 20, Light in the Darkest Night, part 6. The Bible has an immense amount to say about light and all of the different ways in which God uses it both literally and symbolically, figuratively, but also because it reflects his glory. He is light. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And so you would expect to find a great deal said about light in Scripture. We're back there in Exodus chapter 14. Last week, we reviewed the seven things that we've learned about light in Scripture, and then we added five more, or four and a half more, to that list. I'll read it through quickly. First, Jesus Christ is the one who led the light or the light that led Israel, guarded Israel, gave darkness to the Egyptians, revealed God to Israel, and he's the one who reveals the Father to us. And we saw the reason for that is because the Bible begins with light when God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it ends with light. And John tells us the reason. This then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness of all. Second, Jesus himself fulfills the prophecies of bringing light to those who sat in darkness, Third, we saw that since Jesus himself is the light, all references to the Shekinah glory speak of him. Fourth, we saw that there are two stages of being light in the world. Stage one, while Jesus was here, he himself was the light of the world. And stage two, after we went back to heaven, he has called us to reflect his light and to be a light to all those who are still in darkness as we walk through the kingdom of darkness. We are supposed to give light here in the kingdom of darkness. Six, we were called children of light because a child reflects the character of his father, and our father is light. Seventh, while Jesus was on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him on the Mount of the Transfiguration. And then we move to five more keys to understanding light in the Bible. Number eight was Jesus, the source of spiritual light, both for salvation and also for sanctification. Ninth, we saw that his light is the source of our fellowship. That's 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 9, and chapter 2, verse 10. Makes it very clear that your fellowship with other believers is based on walking in the light. If they're walking in darkness, you'll have fellowship with darkness. But if they're walking in the light, you'll not have fellowship with them. Because fellowship is based on light. Number 10, we saw that light is not only for our salvation, sanctification, and fellowship, but it's also what characterizes our spiritual armor. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Then we saw number 11, Jesus is our light now, and he will be our light in heaven for all of eternity. We saw some great passages in the doctrinal epistles, and then closed with some sections out of Revelation, which tells us that there will be no night in heaven because Jesus is the light of heaven. The Lamb gives the light to heaven, and he never goes out. Jesus, the resident of the Shekinah glory, is the light. He's the one that led Israel across the Red Sea, as we've been talking about in our text, and through the wilderness, he's the one who leads us with the light of his word. Then we began last week, but we only saw half of this, a very exciting note on light. Jesus was in the light of the Shekinah that struck down Paul, on the road to Damascus. It's very important. We'll see why in just a moment. But very important. The Apostle Paul points to this over and over throughout the book of Acts and makes reference to it in the epistles as the point at which God sent him on his mission. Because he saw Jesus in the Shekinah and he knew what that meant, that Jesus Christ is God. Acts 9, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and a voice heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, oh, that this would be our response. What wilt thou have me to do? 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and his eyes were opened. He saw no man, but they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. I want to pause there for just a second. If you remember when we were studying the plagues of Egypt, that the plague of darkness, it says they couldn't see anything for three days. Three days here. Three days Christ in the heart of the earth. God is telling us something. We'll talk about the plague of darkness in just a little bit as it connects with our passage. It's three days. He now that he'd eaten or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I, I've heard by many of this man... How, how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Remember we talked about how in the world would Ananias know all this stuff? We talked about the spy network that the believers had when we were back there in Acts chapter 9. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. I'm going to use him. But to use him, he's going to have to learn how to suffer. That's why most of us don't want God to use us. We sort of have a, an intuition, a, a gut feeling that it might just cost us something if we serve the Lord. And we don't want that. We don't want to pay a penalty. We don't want to pay a price. We don't want to give up anything. We want to be comfortable. Should I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? For I must teach him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Oh, there's so much here. Remember, Paul based his entire ministry on this one incident. In fact, the appearance of Jesus in the Shekinah glory is the key point that he mentions when he's speaking to the Jews on the stairs at the Antonia Fortress right after they have been trying to kill him. And when he gets to that point and says, the message Jesus gave me was to go to the Gentiles, they scream and yell and tear their hair and rip their clothes and throw dust up into the air and say, away with this fellow. It is not fit that he should live upon the earth. They understood the implications of the Shekinah. They thought it was just for them. Us Jews, not those Gentiles. We're the ones that have seen the glory of God. We're the ones that have all the, the promises. We're the ones that have all the revelation. What? You're telling me that the Shekinah glory gave you direction to go to Gentiles, those dogs? And they didn't like it. Now that brings us to Acts 22 today. Here we find once again... The Apostle Paul, excuse me, Acts 26. Here again, once again, we find Paul making reference to the event in his defense before King Agrippa. Again, stating that Christ was the one who spoke to him from the Shekinah. Now, you remember King Agrippa married a Jewess, Bernice. He was someone who was well-versed in Jewish law. We've already talked about King Agrippa to some extent and how he said, almost, Paul, thou persuadest me to believe. The almost is not good enough. You can have all the head knowledge in the world, it will not get you to heaven. You can read Hebrew, you can read Greek, you can read Aramaic in the book of Daniel. But that's not going to get you to heaven. You can have all of the systematic theologies memorized, and I don't care which one you want to memorize. You can memorize all of Calvin's institutes, and you can still go to hell. Did you know that? It's not enough to have head knowledge. You have to have faith in Christ. 
But Agrippa would clearly have understood the implications of what the Apostle Paul was saying. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts 26. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. And Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Especially because I know thee to be expert. Now Paul isn't making it up. Paul isn't flattering. Paul isn't lying through his teeth about what Agrippa knows. Agrippa is a man who will understand what Paul is saying, just like the Jews understood back there in Acts chapter 22 when they're screaming and yelling and throwing dirt in the air. You're an expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. In other words, I'm not somebody who showed up out of nowhere claiming some new revelation, you know, that I got, and uh, here I, I'm bringing you something new, but, uh, but you didn't know me before. You didn't know what kind of stuff I was involved in, that I was involved in witchcraft over here, and I was involved in devil worship over here, some kind of weird things like that. Join us Wednesday evening. We're starting a new series this Wednesday on all the pseudo-Christian cults that now are masquerading as churches and literally hundreds of thousands of people in the United States are flocking into those so-called churches hearing all kinds of really weird doctrine. You need to know about it. Please join us Wednesday night. Wait a minute, that was for free. <laughs> Let's go back here. Which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. I was a good Jewish boy. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, under which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. He's building it up. I mean, okay, can you see? Now, what's, which one is he talking about? Agrippa's running through his mind all the different possibilities of what in the world is Paul talking about here? What is the hope? What is the thing that they're looking for? Well, of course, it's the Messiah. But what about the Messiah? All of the Jews are hoping for this. The day at Pesach, at Passover, they're hoping the Messiah will be there because they leave an empty chair for Elijah. And Malachi said that Elijah is going to be the one who's the forerunner of the Messiah. And the youngest child goes to the door in the middle of the Passover meal and opens the door and he comes back and says, Elijah is not here. They're looking for the Messiah. But what Messiah? Let's go on. Now I stand and am a judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope, say King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Oh, now he's focusing in. The hope of Israel. The Messiah. Something about resurrection. I verily thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I set up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Paul had impeccable credentials from a Jewish perspective. From an unbelieving Jewish perspective, although they claimed be serving God, looking for the hope of Israel. But they were looking for a temporal political hope. They were looking for a Messiah who would deliver them from the Romans. They had an agitation, an undercurrent going on throughout all that Jewish leadership of what can we do to get rid of the Romans or how can we compromise with them so that we can keep our own power. We don't want anybody interfering with that. And suddenly Jesus shows up on the stage. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them, even under strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, look at this. He's bringing King Agrippa to something that he knows Agrippa will understand. 
the hope of Israel, manifested at the burning bush, Exodus 3, 13 and 14, manifested on Mount Sinai when the mountain smoked and trembled and the people ran away from it because they were so terrified and they had to set a, a, a perimeter around it so that not even an animal would touch the mountain lest it die. Something that led Israel through the wilderness that separated them from the Egyptians that parted the way in the Red Sea and kept the Egyptians from getting near them as they crossed the Red Sea. Agrippa would have known all of that. It was a big discussion among the Jews that the Shekinah glory would have to appear when the Messiah came. That would be the proof of the Messiah. The Shekinah glory had departed in the days of Ezekiel. You recall it had left the temple and it moved to the, the pinnacle of the temple and paused and then it moved to the top of the Mount of Olives and then it paused and then it disappeared into the wilderness. The Shekinah glory would have to come back. It would be what reveals the Messiah. When Jesus was on earth, do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Where Jesus is speaking with Moshe and Eliyahu, Moses and Elijah. And he shone like the sun. His raiment was so white, it was whiter than any fuller can clean it. He's about to tell King Agrippa what he saw. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we are all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. He was hearing his own language. By the way, for those who are charismatics, Every time so-called tongues shows up in the Bible, it's in the language of the hearer. It's not kind, some kind of babbling. It's not some kind of an angelic language. When angels speak, they always speak the language of the hearers. I heard in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now Agrippa got it at that point. He's not going to believe, but he understands. He puts two and two together. He knows the facts. Dear friends, maybe you're here today. Maybe you're listening over the internet. Maybe you know the facts, but you yet don't believe. Agrippa was an expert in the things of the Jews. This wasn't some ignorant Roman who had just gotten transferred there. This was a man who understood. You know, I think there are a lot of people sitting in churches who understand things and think they're on their way to heaven because they understand. Friend, you can understand and go to hell. Agrippa did. Rise, stand on thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. God has a purpose for your life, just like he did for Paul. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the one in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. He's standing in front of both Jews and Gentiles and half-breeds. He's standing in front of a whole group of people, a council that is there with Agrippa. He's doing what God called him to do. He's telling them this is what God sent me to do. 
to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God. If you don't have Jesus, you're under the power of Satan. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. You are a sinner and lost and headed for hell if you don't have Christ. There are only two sides to be on. Either you're on God's side or you're on the devil's side. You can't be on both sides. And if you don't have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are lost. Doesn't matter how good you are, how much money you give, how much you know. Without Christ in your heart, you are lost. Inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. Sanctification is by faith as well as salvation. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first to them at Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Works don't save you, but works come if you're saved. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both the small and great, saying none other thing than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. The focus of every message has got to be Jesus Christ. Paul makes it that way here. That Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that rise from the dead, and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And Paul says, I know this because I saw the light. And Jesus spoke to me from the light, the light of the Shekinah. He's a very good preacher. <laughs> he starts off drawing the attention. He builds, and then he develops a main theme, and then he recapitulates. He got through his message, but in verse 24, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. Have you ever noticed when you're witnessing to somebody, someone else comes along and tries to interrupt it? I've had that happen to me so many times it isn't funny. I'm sharing Christ with somebody who is intensely interested, who understands what I'm saying, and somebody else comes in and breaks up the conversation. A number of years ago when I was pastoring up in North Jersey, I had a man in my church, he'd come out of a very rough background, very tough guy. He'd been into alcohol, he'd been into all kinds of horrible things, and he trusted Christ. It transformed his life. He and his wife both got saved. Man, did they love the Lord Jesus. They witnessed faithfully to everybody they came in contact with. One day he said to me, you know, my mother, uh, my, not my bro mother, my brother, my brother runs a bar and out of the bar he runs prostitutes. And um, I really feel compelled that you ought to go and talk to him about Jesus. I've talked to him over and over about Jesus. So I went with a brother whose name was Phil and to the bar where his brother Roy was. His brother owned and ran this bar. And um, we were sitting there and talking to Roy. And Roy was really a broken man. He knew he was a sinner. He also knew that he was dying. He knew that he would have to stand before Jesus as the judge very soon. And as I was sharing Christ with Roy, Phil was sitting there and Roy was sitting there and I'm sharing Christ with Roy across this table. This weird dude from across the bar comes over and sits down, pulls up a chair and says, uh, say, this is an interesting conversation. You mind if I join you? And I thought there's a devil at it. So I witnessed to him too. But he kept interjecting, interrupting, trying to change the subject. But that night, Roy prayed to trust Christ as his Savior. And like two days later, he was dead. His family had been Roman Catholic. So they wanted to have a Mass for him. They did all the swinging the things up at the front and the smoke goes all over the place and mumble a little bit of stuff in Latin and so on. But the family was willing to let Phil ask me to do the graveside service. And so I came to the graveside. It was dead of winter, freezing cold. 
wasn't set up the way that we normally have a graveside set up. I'm standing with my back facing the open hole of the grave and the casket is off to the side. And here's this crowd gathered around. Lots of people knew this guy. He'd been their bartender for years. And I thought, if they push me, I go into the grave first, they can drop the coffin on top of me. I preached the gospel from 1 Corinthians 15. And of course, it was longer than a usual graveside because I hadn't done the service. And there were people that were glaring at me, but nobody said anything. And I could see the priest sort of dancing around the outside of the crowd, whispering every now and then to somebody. Bop, 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 bop. There his funny little hat went. Bop, 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 around the outside of the crowd. And I prayed that if anyone there didn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they would understand that Christ died for their sins and was buried and rose again, and that we'd see Phil again in glory, not because he had been a church member, not because he was good, because they all knew he was bad. Not Roy, not Phil, Roy. They all knew he was bad. And then I closed in prayer, and in the prayer I gave an invitation to trust Christ. And after I said amen, the crowd began to disperse, a young woman came up to me, a woman who'd been a prostitute in that bar, and tears streaming down her face. She trusted Jesus during that prayer. Oh, people, the light of Jesus. Are you reflecting his light? There are people who try to interrupt you when you share Christ. Festus did that here. And Agrippa never believed. That brings us to point 13. Jesus is like the light that reaches our eyes. This is new stuff here. If you're taking notes. Sorry. Jesus is like the light that reaches our eyes and through our eyes illumines the entire body. Without sight, you are crippled, handicapped, incapable of doing almost anything in the general world without external help. Seeing the light lets you enjoy beauty. Being able to see the light protects you from danger before it reaches you. Seeing in the light lets you help others. Seeing in the light gives you confidence. It overcomes your fears. And spiritual light is like that too. It lets you see the world from the divine perspective. Light lets you plan in advance because you can perceive things that are still far away. So Jesus is like, this is 13, Jesus is like the light that reaches our eyes and through our eyes illumines the entire body. Listen to what he said in Matthew 6, 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? If the best light you've got is darkness, you know what? It affects your whole body. It doesn't just affect these two little tiny organs that are up in your face. It means that your whole body is crippled. He says it again over in Luke chapter 11, verse 34. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no dark part. Do you know that's what Jesus is pushing for? No darkness in you? Not half darkness, not half light, not shades of gray. Having no dark part, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. 
Now, that's true not only in the physical realm, but for the believer, the Word of God does all of those things. In other words, the Word of God. Seeing in the light of God's Word lets you enjoy true beauty. Being able to see in the light of God's Word protects you from danger before the danger reaches you. You see it coming. Seeing in the light of God's Word lets you help others. Seeing in the light of God's Word gives you confidence. Seeing in the light of God's Word overcomes your fears. Spiritual light from God's Word lets you see the world from the divine perspective. Light from the Bible lets you plan in advance because you can perceive things that are still far away. Just simple illustrations of that. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. God's word is what gives the believer the light to handle life. Practical. Proverbs 22, verse 3 and Proverbs 27, 12. Both verses say exactly the same thing. A prudent man foreseeth the evil. He's able to see. He's got light. And what can he see? He sees the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Both those verses say that. Proverbs 22, 3 and Proverbs 27, 12. In other words, light lets you prepare in advance. It also tells you something else. Amos chapter 5, verse 13. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. A lot of people are sending out all kinds of stuff all over the internet, making political comments here and there and so on. Remember Amos 5.13. Therefore the prudent shall keep silent in that time, for it is an evil time. Point number 14. 14th point. Studying light. When Satan is in control, God makes sure that the earth understands the wickedness of following Satan by sending judgmental darkness. When Satan is in control, God makes sure that the earth understands the wickedness of following Satan by sending judgmental darkness. Now, you know, some weeks ago I did a series on judgmental darkness, and I think America is entering judgmental darkness. It doesn't matter who won the election. I think we are still headed for some judgmental darkness because there are prophecies in Scripture that say it's coming. For example, Matthew 24, 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. God is sending judgment on the whole world at that time, including the United States. Number 15. Ties in with 14. Satan, the so-called God of this world, is a lover of darkness so that people cannot see the light. Satan, the so-called God of the world, is a lover of darkness so that people will not see the light. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You see with your eyes, here Paul puts it graphically, the God of this world hath blinded, that's put out the eyes, the minds. You have physical eyes, you've got eyes of your mind too. Eyes that let you see spiritual things. So Satan has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Number 16. I'm trying to finish today. <laughs> Not sure I'm going to do it. 16. Satan also tries to imitate light as a false god. Satan also tries to imitate light as a false god. This is number 16. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's a fake. He doesn't show up in a little red pajama suit with a forked tail and a pitchfork and horns on his head and a funny little goatee. That's not how Satan appears. He appears as an angel of light because his purpose is deception. I recently was speaking with a person who's been caught up in some of the wilder elements of the charismatic movement with visions, dreams, tongues, healings, and perhaps most significant, with prophecies that claim to be new revelation from God but which don't conform to the revealed word of Scripture. 
Remember what we saw a moment ago over in Psalm 119? The entrance of God's words give light. And anything contrary to God's word brings darkness. Join us on Wednesday evening. We begin that new series on cults that deviate from scripture. Number 17. Jesus also leads us through the darkest nights of our sojourning here on earth. Jesus also leads us through the darkest nights of our sojourning here on earth. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 11, beginning in verse 9. Jesus answered, Are there not yet twelve hours in a day? If a man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Light of this world is external. But Jesus says, there's another way of stumbling because you don't have light in you. Verse 35, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. You know, with the apostles during the apostolic period, God did this quite dramatically. Over in Acts chapter 12, Beginning in verse 7, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. God's giving some direction here to Peter. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And he did so. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. I mean, he has to even tell him to get dressed. Peter's like this, you know. Have you ever been woke up in the middle of the night and thought, What in the world is going on? You know, didn't know what you're doing. Here's Peter. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened of them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, <laughs> Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. And from all the expectation of the people of the Jews, he finally woke up. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary the Mark, uh, mother of John, whose surname was Mark, and there were many gathered together praying. Oh, Lord, let Peter out of prison. Let Peter out of prison. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. We talked about a little bit earlier how she was probably the younger sister of John Mark. But ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. We're praying for his release. Now go away. But she can constantly affirm that it was even so. Then said they, It's his angel. Then now go away. Go away. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Have you ever been astonished when God answers your prayers? Because you really weren't expecting God to answer. O ye of little faith, but he beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. The prudent foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Really interesting when you see some of these principles at work in the New Testament. God giving spiritual light as well as physical light and then leading by the light through the impossible situation which God did with Peter, which God did with Moses and the children of Israel as they crossed the Red Sea. The impossible, not the hard situation, the impossible situations. We have illustrations of that all over Scripture. Number 18. You know what? I've got two more points. I'm not going to make it today. We're already 17 after. Let's go ahead and close. We'll pick it up there next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that Jesus is the light. How we thank you that he leads us through the darkness. How we thank you that when he leads, he breaks open the impossible ways. But we must follow him. If Peter had rolled over and said, I don't believe it, I'm going back to sleep. If Moses had refused to stretch out his hand, if the people had refused to go forward, we would not have Israel today. Teach us, Father, to follow, for we have your light. It clearly shines to us through the word of God. It transforms us as we study it, as we memorize it, as we meditate upon it. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Jesus, who spoke from the Shekinah glory, is the living word. The light of the Shekinah glory shines to us in the Bible. The written word. 
Teach us, Father, to be people who obey you, not merely people who have a head knowledge like Agrippa, but people who believe because it is true. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today, much in harmony.